Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar today on Law Firm Client Mandates, Managing Your De Facto Regulations. Just a couple of quick housekeeping items before we begin. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the question box um, in your GoToWebinar tool, and they will be answered at the end of the webinar. Also, this webinar will be recorded and you will receive a copy of it after the webinar. It will also be available for on-demand download on our website. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Paul, who will talk to you about law firm client mandate. Thanks, Robin. I uh, appreciate that. Um, thanks, everybody, for attending this morning. Uh, we are going to be talking about uh, law firm client mandates today, which I think is a somewhat interesting area because uh, law firms I consider to be amongst the highest value targets. However, uh, there's not really a, a well-matured regulatory environment that speaks specifically to the law firm. And so what ends up happening is the client mandates that you guys are all receiving become your de facto regulations uh, that you must comply with in order to either win business or in some cases not win business. And uh, that's really what we're going to talk about today is how do, we, how do we overcome these individual client mandates as they come in and are there ways that we can perhaps more intelligently position ourselves to answer multiple mandates uh, with one program. And uh, a little bit of a spoiler alert, uh, the answer to that is yes. So uh, my name is Paul Cayazzo. I'm a co-founder and I'm also the Chief Security Architect here at TrueShield. Um, I've got about 17 years of experience in information security. Um, and I will say that if uh, anybody out there wants to reach out to me on either LinkedIn or Twitter or via email, you can feel free to do so. Um, if you have questions about this specific topic or anything else within the realm of information security, I'm more than happy to talk to you about that. So please do feel free to reach out. So TrueShield, we are a uh, global cybersecurity company based here in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, we like to call ourselves a con concierge provider of cybersecurity services. Uh, we're not simply an uh, organization that's going to ship reports or do the minimum uh, check-the-box sort of service for, for you guys. We're a high-quality uh, uh, provider that, that really you know, drives down to the root causes of issues uh, and helps clients solve problems at their core uh, rather than uh, curing symptoms, so to speak. So the areas where we spend the most of our time working are within managed security services, our continuing security monitoring platform, which is a 24-7 managed security operations center. Um, additionally, we spend quite a bit of time with our law firm clients doing risk assessments, uh, penetration tests, vulnerability assessments, and compromise assessments. Um, and each one of those are actually a requirement of nearly every client mandate that's out there. Um, additionally, we're also experts at security consulting and security architecture uh, and a whole lot more stuff. Uh, we custom tailor our solutions to the clients that we, that we work with on a day-in and day-out basis, many of whom are within the legal industry. Um, other industries of focus for us include the government, uh, the financial in industry, uh, e-commerce, uh, utilities, and, and several others like that. And that's relevant to uh, you folks in law firms because those are the industries that your clients operate in. And so working with a partner such as TrueShield who has experience not only dealing with the law firm but also dealing with the same types of entities that you guys are interacting with actually gives you an advantage in terms of how to structure your security program so that you can address those client mandates. Uh, what you'll find is that many of the mandates are asking you to do the same things, but they're calling them a little bit different, uh, each individual one. And that's simply because the lexicon is different for uh, each different regulation, even though the requirement is effectively the same. So things that we're going to talk about today <coughs> include really the core issues that law firms are facing. We're going to try to delve deep into why this is happening uh, to law firms on a, on a day in and day out basis and what it actually means to you. Uh, we're then going to uh, pivot over to what you really need to be thinking about and what you need to be doing in order to get ahead of those client mandates, because that's really what we're going to try to coach you to do, rather than respond to them, get ahead of them. And then, of course, we're going to talk a little bit about how a managed security services provider like Trucia can help, and then I'll open the question and answer phase as well. So with that said, the issue, uh, we really feel the issue is that law firms are extremely high value targets. And unfortunately, due to uh, some historical events that have happened and the lack of that uh, governing body, that regulatory body that speaks specifically to a law firm, often what we found is that law firms do lack critical protections over their security programs. And that ends up uh, really resulting in a big challenge. Uh, significant attention comes uh, uh, to law firms from many different angles. And we're going to talk about that in a second here. What I was uh, getting at is that there's significant attention to law firms based upon three different uh, um, areas that you need to focus on. You're getting significant attention from clients, 
you're getting significant attention from attackers, and you're getting significant attention from the executive board as well. Uh, what clients are most interested in is that you're, you're worried about their client mandates. You're looking at your security controls in a proactive manner, and you're implementing a program that covers um, those, those regulatory requirements. Those uh, clients, they operate in environments where they absolutely must comply with a regulation, be that PCI or FISMA or uh, FINRA or whatever it ends up being. There's a, a compliance component to your client's business that they simply must uh, uh, um, be in compliance with in order for them to operate. Since uh, you are processing their sensitive information, they're going to pass that regulatory requirement on down to you. And uh, that's something that you need to be thinking about as you're structuring your programs. Although you don't necessarily have a, a regulatory requirement yourself, uh, in order to do business with clients that do, you may well have to implement a, a compliant security program to that uh, uh, regulation. So that's something to bear in mind. It is your de facto regulation, the client mandate. Um, the attackers, of course, are worried about stealing from you. They're trying to get at your client's intellectual property. They're trying to get at financial data that your clients may process on their systems. Uh, if possible, they're going to try to get case information whenever they can, and that's extremely valuable information in the wrong hands. And so you know, your, your clients know that just as well as, as the attackers do, and uh, so that's why they're asking you to do uh, all of the you know, additional legwork that they're asking you to do in these client mandates. Um, and that's, you know, it's important that you recognize that you are the stewards of, of that information. Uh, the fact that you, you store and process that information in your own systems uh, actually leaves you with a, some legal requirement to protect it. And that legal requirement really comes in the form of the American Bar Association Model Rule 1.6C, um, which, which uh, is, is really the big driver for the majority of this stuff. Your executive board is, is worried that uh, um, you, know, you need to continuously be in compliance with that model rule. But additionally, that you're driving business, uh, that your law firm is able to operate, able to bring in new clients, and able to respond to these new client mandates as they come in, uh, because they can either uh, get in your way or, or be something that helps you, uh, um, you know, drive additional business. So you, as the CIO or as the director of IT security or, or some role like that, have these competing priorities, these competing pressures coming from these different angles, and it's something that's absolutely vital that you understand you know, the, the drivers behind what's, what's behind this. So if you think about it from the perspective of you've really got to uh, answer the mail on each one of these, uh, that, that should help you frame your security program a little bit more constructively uh, to be able to, again, proactively prevent the, the bad things from happening. So I mentioned that client mandates are the de facto regulations, and I've included here the American Bar Association Model Rule 1.6c. And it states that a lawyer shall make reasonable efforts to prevent the inadvertent or unauthorized disclosure of or unauthorized access to information relating to the representation of a client. So what does that mean? And, and there's actually been a significant amount of debate over what, what constitute reasonable efforts. And in fact, we're going to be following this webinar up with another speaking specifically to that reasonable care uh, language uh, a little bit later in the year. So I'd invite you to participate in that as well. Um, but effectively, what, it, what that's saying is that you need to uh, prevent not only inadvertent or unauthorized disclosure of, uh, but also unauthorized access to. So we're talking about malicious activity as well as accidental data leakage. And those are things that uh, you, you are required by the American Bar Association to be thinking about. Uh, the regulations that you'll find that impacts, uh, or, or in fact vice versa, are, are many. Your, your clients operate in many different industries, including healthcare, government, finance, e-commerce, what have you. Uh, and each of those uh, um, environments and each of those industry verticals has regulations that are impactful to it. We see quite often with our law firm uh, community clients is uh, HIPAA regulations that have to be complied with. So HIPAA, meaning the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, uh, aka you've got to protect uh, personal health information wherever possible. In a lot of cases, uh, we don't see law firms that actually process personal health information unless they deal with perhaps uh, in the social security cases or uh, um, you know, disability insurance and things like that, and then we can sometimes find private health information on, on uh, law firm networks. The majority of the time, though, the fact that the client itself is processing the private health information, or PHI, uh, means that they're going to push that HIPAA mandate off to you, and there's definitely going to be some specific regulations uh, with HIPAA that you're going to have to comply with. FISMA is a similar uh, kind of thing. So FISMA being the uh, Federal Information Security Management Act uh, is a requirement that all government agencies must comply with, and uh, basically states that there's uh, you know, a large security program that the organization needs to have thought through and have implemented and can prove uh, has been implemented correctly um, to address any number of, of different components of the information security stack. 
And if you have any government clients or even any clients that interact with the government, such as perhaps a defense contractor, uh, they are going to have to comply with FISMA and they're going to have to produce documentation to their clients themselves, aka the government, uh, that they're actually in compliance with it. So a lot of times, uh, just dealing with organizations like that that offer services to the government means that you, the law firm, are also going to have uh, some requirement to attest or assert that you've uh, um, planned for, thought of, and implemented controls compliant with the FISMA regulations. In a very similar regard, the payment card industry, or PCI, has a, a security standard called the PCI DSS, or the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, that if you're working with any organization that processes payment cards in any way, shape, or form, they must comply with. And again, that's an area where even if you as a law firm don't process payment card information yourselves, if your clients do, they're going to ask you to attest or assert that you've uh, implemented controls compliant with PCI regulations. And that, uh, again, bears some specific nomenclature that will uh, basically ask you to do the same sorts of things that either HIPAA or FISMA are asking you to do, but the nomenclature is going to be different and it's going to be slanted more towards protecting payment card information. Effectively, the controls are the same. We're trying to protect information. We're trying to protect data. Um, FFIC, FINRA, Sarbanes-Oxley, the list goes on and on. There are, there are many regulations that your clients are likely to find themselves uh, uh, required to comply with. Nearly all of them have some cybersecurity component to them. And that cybersecurity component is what the client mandate is, is asking you to do. So what does it look like when it gets in your hands? Usually what we've seen are, are very long checklists that ask you to uh, assert what it is you're doing with, more, with some specific control sometimes provide evidence uh, asserting that uh, you actually have implemented the control, uh, sometimes just asking you to self-attest that the controls are in place. Um, <clears throat> what I've seen more often than not is that the client mandate is asking the law firm to have performed a third-party assessment of the security operation. And that's beneficial not only to the client in reducing their own third-party risk, um, and, and that third-party risk in this case is you as the person uh, or, or identity or entity that is processing their information, um, but also it's going to help. Uh, um, uh, it's going to help you, and um, that that third-party assessment is going to effectively uh, um, be bundleable in, in in a way that will help you answer these client mandates as they come in. Also, if you're consulting with a good uh, third-party assessment organization, they're going to help you structure your program so that it does meet uh, all of those different regulations. Um, so it's important to remember that as you're as you're going through this. It's not necessary for you to have you know to reinvent the wheel on this. Uh, it's, it's, probably better, cheaper, and easier uh, with a better ultimate result for you to work with a third-party assessment organization that is capable of doing it for you. Um, but the, really, the question is, why is there such an increase in scrutiny on this? I know if, if any of the uh, audience has been in the law firm industry for quite some time, you've seen that the client mandates are, are coming faster and, and more furiously uh, and, you know, within the last couple of years. And there are real good reasons for that. Um, and those are many of these uh, logos here. Uh, Third-party risk is something that is very high on the agenda for executive boards right now. And by third-party risk, what I really mean is uh, there have been recent breaches at very large organizations that have come through vulnerabilities on the vendor side and not necessarily on the part of the uh, organization that was breached themselves. The perfect example of this is Target. Target is the victim of one of the largest data breaches in the United States history. And in fact, the vulnerability wasn't even really on the target systems, at least the initial uh, entry point. Uh, what actually happened there is Target's HVAC vendor had a vulnerability in their systems, and due to the interconnectivity of systems between third parties and uh, um, you know, the clients of those third parties, uh, there is a, an increased opportunity for an attacker to pivot once they gained a foothold within any of their service providers. Uh, certainly, uh, Target can attest to the fact that that third party risk was not adequately managed. That risk was not mitigated to the point that it should have been, and it resulted in you know, millions and millions of, of lost uh, records and, and uh, significant financial loss and liability to Target itself. Every organization on this screen is in a similar boat. There, there was a major data breach associated with each one of these, and I'm sure that your you know, executive directors, uh, your managing partners, don't want to see their firm's name on a list like this. Um, I know I wouldn't. Um, and the other thing to bear in mind with each of these <clears throat> Every one of these organizations, by virtue of the work that they do or the industry they operate in, um, they have a compliance mandate. They have either FISMA that they must be compliant with in the case of, of the Office of Personnel Management or OPM. Um, they've got PCI that they must be compliant with. Uh, some of these have uh, HIPAA, uh, obviously Anthem would. Um, most of them also have the FIC, um, which all, again, stipulate that these organizations have a minimum level of compliance in order for them to operate. 
So the question that should beg is, if these organizations are in operation, they must have uh, attested or asserted that they are compliant with their mandate. So what happened? If they are compliant, how did these data breaches occur? And, and that's a, a question which we're going to touch on in a few minutes here. Um, the, the thesis there is that compliance does not equate to security. In fact, compliance should simply be a byproduct of a good security program. Um, but one way or another, let's bring it back to law firms. So law firms process extremely sensitive client information, extremely sensitive. If you're a patent attorney, um, that intellectual property is the lifeblood of your client. In fact, if you're in any sort of organization that is, is processing uh, intellectual property as a result of representing a, a client organization, that intellectual property is the key to the castle. And there is significant attention from advanced persistent threats in the developing world to get at that intellectual property. And, and that helps the bad guys in this case circumvent the research and development component of bringing products to market so that they don't have to invest in R&D. They simply steal that uh, intellectual property and get straight to the uh, you know, go to market phase. Uh, that happens all the time. It, uh, uh, you'd, you'd actually be surprised at how often that's, that sort of industrial espionage occurs. And the organizations whose intellectual property it is, they, they, they know that that's their lifeblood. And so they put significant protection around that intellectual property. Those same protections are going to be foisted upon you. And if you're not uh, um, you know, doing your due diligence and protecting your client's intellectual property, then there's significant liability uh, if, if that data were breached um, as a result of your, uh, your law firm's negligence. Of course, there's always personally identifiable information on any network. Uh, I don't care what industry you're in, there's PII on your network in some way, shape, or form. Even if it's just employee information, it's still PII that has to be protected. Um, and, and bad guys are going to try to get at that, and that you know, happens literally every day. Of course, case and legislation information, um, any sort of case information, you know, think about some of the high-profile cases that your firm works on. If the uh, um, organization that you're representing, if, they're, you know, if you're, uh, some, some critical document about the case were to be leaked, and it, and it wound up in the hands of, of you know, the, the other side of that, that, uh, um, that firm you're representing, that could be very damaging to the case that your, your, your firm is representing right then. And obviously that's information which has to be extremely uh, uh, well protected, extremely well guarded, and not just uh, you know, trying to prevent the, the uh, unauthorized access to it, but also detect if something bad has happened to it. And that's an important component we're going to talk about in a minute as well. Um, of course, obviously, you are, as a representative of, of your client firms, likely have access to financial information of that firm. Um, if you're representing that, that firm for any significant length of time, there's probably very, uh, very potentially damaging information that could be leaked as a result of your not doing your due diligence over that financial information. And we see this all the time. Uh, you know, the law firm, uh, more so now than ever, uh, it has to put significant effort, significant budget, significant attention towards protecting this sort of information. And if you don't do it, you're going to be at significant risk of, of financial liability, of reputation liability, um, and you know, that's going to be a, a, a big barrier to future business for you guys. Uh, the attackers know all of that. The, the attackers know full well that you guys process high value information. They know that you're processing that intellectual property. They know that you're storing that case information. They know that you're storing that financial information about your clients, and they know that you almost certainly have some interesting financial or per, uh, personally identifiable information that is uh, um, you know, very valuable to the bad guys. They know that. Uh, they also know that you have no industry-wide standard regarding cybersecurity. You don't have a FISMA uh, that's directly applicable to you that you absolutely must comply with or else you're taken out of business by a regulatory body. Uh, that doesn't exist in the law firm. You have de facto regulations in the form of client mandates, but the bad guys also know that law firms have lagged in the application of cybersecurity controls. They know that um, you are playing catch-up. You're reacting to client mandates rather than developing plans and programs which will uh, um, answer the mail on those before it actually happens to you, before that client mandate lands on your door. Uh, they know all this stuff, and they're using this information to monetize whatever they can get out of you. Uh, there, if there's one rule of thumb about the cyber criminal, it's that they're going to try to monetize information in the easiest manner possible. They're going to try to exploit the weakest link to get at that uh, sensitive or valuable information. And unfortunately, in many cases, we've seen law firms have been that weak link. Um, and that, that's, I think, the title shift that we're seeing change. And it's really come as a result of the client mandates. Um, because unfortunately, again, the, the law firms that we've seen are reacting to client mandates. Um, and, and not necessarily driving the situation themselves. So what does that ultimately mean for you? Well, it means a number of things. Uh, first off, it means that there's a significant increased scrutiny on cyber practices. 
And, and that increased scrutiny is either going to be a barrier for you or it's going to be an enabler for you. And what I mean by that is that if you're extremely proactive and put together a very good security program, uh, that's going to be an enabler of business for you. Uh, you're going to be able to go out and get new business from new clients um, much more efficiently, much more quickly uh, than, than what you are now um, or what you would be able to otherwise. And you know that, if you remember the, the scrutiny or the pressures from competing angles slide that we talked about earlier, your executive board and your managing partners are looking at that as uh, you know a, a means by which that they can generate new revenues. You know, they're, they're, you're going to be looking for new uh, new ways to bring new clients into the firm, and having a very sound security posture that you can attest has been uh, um, you know reviewed by a third-party expert uh, organization. That's going to be an enabler for you. And not just that, it's also going to reduce the, the life cycle of that, uh, the, the business capture process. So you know, think about now, how much time are you spending answering client mandates? And if you can do that much more efficiently and much more quickly, that's going to enable uh, your firm to capture that revenue that much quicker. And on the flip side of that, if you're not able to do that, or if you're not able to uh, implement uh, the client mandate in a timely enough fashion, that business might walk away and it might walk over to your competitor. Um, or, you know, worst case scenario, let's say you do win the business and you, you've uh, attested that you were compliant to a client mandate and it turns out that you weren't, uh, you know, there's some significant liabilities associated with that and that, that could be a business ending sort of event, a resume generating event. Uh, you don't want to be in that sort of situation. And so what do you need to do there? Well, first off, don't be reactive. Uh, you, you can't be reacting to client mandates as they come in. It's just simply not an efficient way to, to go about doing business. Yes, of course, you're going to get new client mandates all the time, and those client mandates are going to be asking for different things. But what I think you'll reveal as you peel the, the layers of the onion back is that the client mandates effectively are asking you to do the same things over and over again. Um, it, even if they're from clients in different industries, they're asking you to have a good uh, prevention strategy for you know, your, your uh, network perimeter. They're, they're asking you to have a good incident response process. They're asking you to have good disaster recovery, uh, good access controls, things like that. They may call them different things from FISMA to PCI or to HIPAA, but effectively they're asking you to do the same thing. So what does that, what does that really mean? Does that, that, I think that means that uh, if, if you are looking at this as a, um, a reactive uh, uh, sort of exercise where you're going to implement controls as your clients are requesting them, that's going to wind up being extremely costly uh, to you. And ultimately, I think it's actually quite risky to do it in that regard as well, uh, because you're effectively, you're at that point, you're, you're looking at it as a check the box exercise. Uh, you're looking at that client mandate as, this is what I need to do, and I don't need to be thinking about other than anything other than what's in this client mandate. And that, I, I really consider that to be a very risky approach. That's kind of the, the minimum. Uh, and if you want to get by doing the bare minimum, uh, that's actually going to be a very high liability to your firm. Uh, and not really a good way to, uh, um, first off, do the due diligence of, of you know, protecting your client's information in, in accordance with uh, ABA Model Rule 1.6c, but also uh, you know, not going to be an efficient way to spend the limited resources that you have on a cybersecurity program. So what do you actually need to be doing? Well, I think it's obvious. You certainly need to be proactive. Um, we view the cybersecurity program as a, um, made up of several different pieces. But I think those pieces to, to us uh, uh, fall largely into these four categories. Uh, and those are prevention, detection, containment, and eradication uh, in that order. Um, so with prevention, you want to be focused on trying to stop whatever you can at the network edge uh, so that the bad guys can't get into your network or the insiders can't steal information without somebody seeing it. Um, it's that simple, uh, if you think of an analogy, that's, the, that's your firewall. Your firewall, your IPS is, is helping you answer the mail on that prevention side of the fact. But it's really not just a technology thing. Uh, there's also uh, um, you know, planning, strategy, and process that's involved in every one of these puzzle pieces here. Um, on the detection side, you want to make sure that you're able to see uh, you know, that sort of malicious traffic or you're able to see those sorts of uh, um, you know, activities or events happening in your network very, very quickly. Uh, one of the scariest statistics that I track from an a, a industry-wide cybersecurity perspective is how long does it take to detect an incident on a network? And the average uh, across all industries is 210 days. And if you have an incident on your network that goes undetected for seven months, you're going to be in really bad shape uh, and, and you're likely exposed all of your client's data, um, which is obviously not ideal. So I think significant attention has got to get uh, uh, focused on, on, on detection. And that comes through technologies like a SIM, or perhaps through a managed security services provider, um, or through an IDS. Uh, and, and in fact, not, not or, but it's more of an and. 
Uh, you really need all of those components in order to stack up to something which will actually uh, do the job. Um, then you need to think about containment. So let's say you know we did our job on prevention, we did our job of detection, and we actually found the piece of malware uh, in our environment. Then you've got to really think about how do I contain this? Um, and in fact, the containment thing is one of those areas where you really need to be thinking about it from the start. Uh, I think one of the best containment strategies that I typically see is things like network segmentation um, and, and uh, um, really good uh, um, uh, configuration baselines that enforce the security concepts of least privilege and least functionality. And those are things that you really need to bake into your environment essentially from day one. Um, you can certainly retrofit a containment strategy on top of a network. Usually it's going to require some re-architecture, uh, which there's some, you know, there, there can be some challenges to, to overcome with respect to that. But um, the, the nice thing about it is those challenges come with great rewards. Because if you've done your job and have implemented a good containment strategy, then eradication becomes that much easier. Um, and eradication is an area where you've kicked in your incident response process and you've got to eliminate the malicious actor um, or the you know, piece of malware or whatever it is that's found its way into your system. If your containment strategy is good, that should be a really simple thing for you to do. It might be a single machine that you've got to go and clean up. If your containment strategy is bad, it could be every machine that you've got to go and clean up. And, and that is another uh, resume generating event uh, for most cybersecurity organizations. So really, if you think about your cybersecurity program as uh, um, must-haves, uh, each, uh, each of these capabilities, um, and again, not just the technology component of it, but the planning, the process, the, the policy around each of these, and then the ongoing operations to make sure that these are continuously uh, kept healthy, uh, they're continuously updated, um, they're continuously operated 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. That is proactive cybersecurity. And what that's going to do, those sound strategies, that is, uh, and, and the strategies backed up by tactics and backed up by operations, that is going to help you address model rule uh, 1.6, and it's also going to address each and every one of those client mandates. If you've done your job on these four uh, um, puzzle pieces, you are almost certainly going to be proactively addressing all the client mandates that come in. And effectively, at that point, it really is simply handing off uh, your security program to your client and saying, we've done our homework, here's our security program, we know we're compliant. That's also going to actively protect your firm from the high financial and reputation liabilities that you would be exposed to if you didn't do this stuff. So think of it not just as a paperwork exercise that's intended to achieve compliance. That's not the goal. The goal is to achieve security and compliance will flow from that. Um, so again, the best way to do this is to build a program, standardize, uh, and, and don't try to reinvent the wheel. Also, bear in mind that it's actually pretty foolish uh, in terms of, of exhausting a, a finite pool of resources to try to build multiple compliance programs, even though you have clients that might operate in the financial industry or the healthcare industry or you know whatever industry, and again, those, those uh, compliance standards might be different. They might say HIPAA on the top versus FISMA on the top. Uh, you really don't want to be building compliance programs for every single one of those internally. Uh, instead, what makes much more sense is to follow an industry-developed framework. That framework that we see quite often in the law firm community is ISO 27001. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you can also follow the FISMA uh, framework or effectively even you know, PCI or any one of them. Uh, there, there are frameworks that you can build your programs around um, and, and then uh, uh, work out from there. What I would suggest for organizations that are just looking at this for the first time and thinking about how do I build a program um, or even how do I assess the effectiveness of my current program, look at the SANS 20 uh, critical security controls. Uh, that, I think, is a great uh, um, reference framework for organizations to implement technical security controls that will help you answer the mail on all those client mandates. And it's actually structured in a way which helps you walk down a maturity roadmap. Uh, so it, it basically will, will align with what are quick wins that you can make with respect to, for instance, prevention, or what is a, a mature or an advanced organization doing with respect to detection, for instance. Um, and that's actually a really good way to assess yourself against that, that framework. Give yourself kind of a report card or a score of how well we're doing, how healthy my security posture is across all of these different domains. Um, once you've done all that, you're then poised to develop that security plan. Uh, that security plan is going to uh, basically state, here is, is what we're trying to do from a, a security program standpoint. These are the controls that we're going to implement to support the policy that we're being handed. Um, and, and then you're going to uh, need to demonstrate that you've actually implemented those controls. That security program then should be crosswalked against the regulations that your clients exist within. So you've built one security program, but you know you've got clients that are 
uh, HIPAA uh, uh, required or PCI required or PISMA. Um, so what we usually see or what we usually recommend our clients do in those cases is within that security program, perhaps right at the top, include a requirement traceability matrix, which covers each of those uh, uh, compliance requirements of, of the industry that your, uh, your clients work within. So again, if you have clients that are healthcare and PCI or, or e-commerce, then it would make sense to have a requirements traceability matrix, which includes you know, the internal controls that you're, you're subscribed to that you must implement for your own policy compliance, and then also uh, the HIPAA uh, mandates and the PCI mandates. And effectively, that table should just be references to the internal controls within your security program that you can point clients to so that when you have, again, a healthcare client, you can say, take a look at the uh, controls reference on the HIPAA uh, uh, row of the table, and then that's going to answer the vast majority of those client mandate questions that come across. Uh, the result effectively at the end of that is that run book. Uh, that run book that you can hand off to potential clients when that new mandate comes in, there's really going to be much, much less uh, reactive work on your part to, to sit there and, and, and pour through those exhaustive checklists. Um, and really, by the way, <clears throat> your client data actually becomes secure, and that's the whole point. The, the point, again, is not to comply. The point is to be secure. Uh, compliance should be viewed as a byproduct of good security. And uh, I always get questions when I, when, I, when I say that because, well, aren't we really being driven to compliance? And that's true. You certainly do have to comply with your mandates. But really, you shouldn't be looking at compliance as the be-all, end-all of your cybersecurity program. Uh, it's a good litmus test to at least gain some understanding of your maturity level. But if you, if you recall uh, that slide uh, earlier where I talked to third-party risks, again, each of those organizations, Target, OPM, J.P. Morgan Chase, um, the list goes on and on, Anthem, uh, every one of those uh, had to have attested at some point in time that they were compliant with some mandate, and yet were still not secure. So if you kind of pivot how you're looking at this problem and think, compliance isn't necessarily my core driver, security is my core driver, and compliance flows from security, you're going to be in a much, much better state. Always remember, compliance is a byproduct of good security and not the other way around. So how do you do this? Well, I'd like to recommend at least one potential solution to you. Um, certainly, you're able to do uh, any of the stuff that we talked about yourselves. However, I'd, I'd like to say that managed security services providers such as TrueShield bring quite a lot to the table uh, that can help you very quickly achieve a high technical capability um, or uh, very quickly help you develop those programs which will uh, enable that crosswalk. Um, or even perform that crosswalk for you. Uh, that subject matter expertise of organizations uh, with experience in legal settings is, is critical for, for, uh, for you guys out there in the law firm community. If you're working with organizations that are performing third-party assessments for you or performing managed services for you that don't have that focus of, of law firm experience, and even better, a law firm with your specific industry of focus, uh, then you know, you're going to be leaving a little bit of capability on the table, uh, because, or in fact, some money as well, because that, that, that firm that's doing the assessment for you, performing the managed services for you, there's some learning curve uh, uh, to get up to speed with respect to how to interact with a law firm, uh, what, what's really the drivers within a law firm, and that's an important thing to be thinking about. Uh, you know, a managed security services pro provider is always going to have uh, a deep level of subject matter expertise, well, at least the good ones do. And that level of subject matter expertise is something that you can leverage to effectively leapfrog uh, uh, you know, over the initial steps of building that security program. Again, you don't really want to be reinventing the wheel. It's better to work with an organization that's done it before that can help you quickly achieve that technical capability at a much lower cost. And in fact, if you're working with a managed security services provider, uh, like TrueShield, there is in fact some transfer of risk. Uh, as part of the, uh, um, the legal uh, agreements that we've got with, with our clients, for instance, um, there is a, a level of risk that gets transferred to us via our master services agreement. You know, we attest that we're compliant with that, uh, uh, you know, with our own mandates, which we've crosswalked against all of those regulations I mentioned, and you know, that gets effectively handed to our clients. And and so they they know that by working with us, that they've answered the mail on ABA Model Rule 1.6C. They know if they've got a FISMA client uh, mandate coming in, that they're going to be able to answer it because that managed security services provider can, can produce documentation which shows that they're FISMA compliant or PCI compliant or HIPAA compliant or whatever. Um, and that's really valuable uh, uh, to the, the client law firm. Um, it's, it's, again, a, a way to short circuit the situation so that we can get to the finish line that much quicker. And again, always remember the finish line is not compliance, the finish line is security. So with that said, <clears throat> I'm going to open the floor to some questions. So let's see what's out there here. Um, all right. 
So one question that was asked is, I mentioned multiple frameworks for standardization. Is there one that I would recommend above the others? Um, well, that's a good question. And actually, the, the, the way to look at that is that um, I, I look at it as the same set of eggs in a different basket, so to speak. So um, PCI is going to be asking you to do a certain set of security controls. And again, HIPAA is going to be asking you to do largely the same thing. Um, I think if you were going to pick one framework that you wanted to uh, start with, I would really default to that SAN 20 critical security controls. But bear in mind that that, that 20 critical security controls is a very technology-focused framework. And it's not going to cover things like policy planning and strategy. Um, that is, you're going to have to get from someplace else. Um, and you know, there are some frameworks out there that deal more with that side of the house. Um, including COBIT, for instance, or even ITIL uh, has some of that, that aspect of it. Um, but if you start with the SANS 20 critical security controls and, and you know, perform first off a current data system and then start building controls around what's in that, you're, you're going to set yourself up for success uh, because you'll understand exactly where your big challenges are and you're going to be able to invest resources in, in, in directly addressing those, uh, those weaknesses. So let's see, another question. Um, with regulations have, uh, across multiple industries having their own requirements, how do we know we'll be fulfilling all of them? Um, so that's good. I guess uh, the question is, if I'm compliant with PCI, am I also compliant with HIPAA? Um, I think the answer to that is yes and no. Uh, there, there are a certain benchmarks or thresholds that you've got to hit within each of those compliance mandates that, for instance, I'll give an example for FISMA. Um, you know, if you have a, a system within FISMA that is rated a moderate, which is a very specific thing within the federal government, then you have a certain rigor of control that you must implement, which may or may not meet the rigor that HIPAA requires you to implement. Um, so I think, again, the best way to do, to answer that question is build yourself a secure and, and well thought out cybersecurity program that includes the, the policy, the strategy, and the process in each of those four main capability areas. Uh, those capability areas being prevention, detection, containment, and eradication. If you build a program based around that stuff, um, you are going to be compliant with all of those, those mandates. You may have to produce some documentation or create some, uh, some paperwork to help attest to that uh, uh, compliance, but you actually will be uh, just by virtue of having done a good job building that security program. Uh, it's a question I actually get quite a bit, and, and again, that's, that's also one of the reasons why I try to shift our, our client's attention away from compliance being the bottom line driver to security and, and, and due diligence being the bottom line driver with compliance being an output of that process. Um, next question I've got is what sort of maintenance do I need to plan for the compliance upkeep year over year? Um, okay, so that's a good question. So, so uh, let's say a client comes to you with a client mandate today that says you've got to be PCI compliant and I need you to assert uh, or attest that these 20 controls have been implemented. Are they going to ask you to do something else or the same thing next year, or are they going to ask you to do anything next year? And in most cases, the answer is yes. Uh, in most cases, what they're going to ask you to do year over year is perform a certain set of services that are pretty much across all regulations you're going to have to do something like this. Um, those, that set of services I'm talking about usually involves a, a third party uh, independent assessment organization. Uh, and that third party assessment organization is going to need to review your security program from uh, either you know, a policy or, or security program control implementation perspective and uh, you know, test whether or not you've implemented it correctly. Um, and then secondarily to that, you'll have to do usually at least one penetration test per year. Um, you know, we think it's advisable to do much more frequent penetration tests than that, um, usually at least quarterly, sometimes monthly. Um, and also you have to do some frequency of vulnerability scanning as well. And not just the scanning and testing component of it, but you're actually going to have to show to your clients and, and your assessor that you're doing something with the findings, that you're implementing the fixes, that you're improving your security posture, that you're you know, um, you know, patching your systems, things like that. That's all really important. And if you're, if you're not doing that stuff, you're in, you're in bad shape already. Um, in addition to that, uh, um, you may end up finding that you'll have to do um, at least, actually, probably every regulation, you're going to have to do some set of training. Uh, and usually, that's going to be a minimum uh, security awareness training. Um, but in some regulations, I'm seeing more and more uh, that you're going to be tasked with doing specialized security training. And that specialized security training will fall into a couple different categories. Uh, first off, the, the specialized security training for employees that have significant security responsibilities. 
Um, so, so you know, your systems administrators or your security engineers, they're going to need training on the tools that you have, uh, which implement your your security controls. And then, additionally to that, usually you're going to need to do some sort of uh, social engineering training, um, aka anti phishing. So you'll have to do some sort of phishing assessment or social engineering assessment against your organization, usually once a year, sometimes more frequently than that. Um, that's about it for monthly or we, uh, uh, annual upkeep year over year in, for your compliance program. Um, but again, remember that if your goal is on security and not necessarily compliance, you should be looking at those activities that I mentioned as not really just to assert that you're compliant with a regulation, but to improve your security posture. So don't, and, and really that's the difference between a check the box organization and an organization that's actually making use of and, and getting value from that third party assessment. So take the results that subject matter experts produce for you and implement them. You know, do something about that, that information. Don't just check the box that says, yeah, we performed our assessment, we're done for the year. Uh, you know, take the findings and, and learn from them. And don't just take the findings and say, okay, I've got this set of 300 vulnerabilities I need to go and fix. Instead, look it up from the perspective of, okay, I've got this set of 300 vulnerabilities. What's really causing that? What's the root cause of this problem that I have this many vulnerabilities in my environment? And let's see if I can address the problem at a root cause. And that really is the big difference between uh, um, the report that you're going to get from an organization that is focused on being a, a, a security partner versus an organization that's simply focused on helping you check the box. Uh, an organization like TrueShield, what we uh, always do is look for root cause analysis and try to determine strategic ways we can help our clients solve those problems uh, so that they're not doing the, you know, the one-off remediation vulnerability by vulnerability by, by vulnerability. I call that uh, vulnerability whack-a-mole. So a vulnerability pops up, you whack it back down. Another one pops up right behind it, you whack it back down. Uh, you never win that game. It's better to look at it from a root cause perspective and try to implement programs which um, are proactive. And, and really, I think that's the best way to tie this all together. If, if you continue to react to client mandates as they come in, you're going to wind up uh, um, spending a whole lot more time on your compliance program than you are on your security program. And it's important to draw the line between the two. Uh, if instead you're proactive up, about building a security program which focuses on those four key areas we talked about, you're going to have already done your homework on compliance and, and it's, it's going to be a much simpler uh, um, exercise for you to respond to client mandates as they come in because that's certainly not going to stop. You're going to continue to get client mandates. You know, um, every time you bring in a new client, there's going to be some uh, mandate that comes with it and I would expect that to increase in frequency over time. Uh, you're definitely not going to see a decrease in the level of scrutiny the attackers have on you. So I certainly wouldn't expect a decrease in the level of scrutiny your clients have on you. So hopefully uh, this has been informative to you. Um, I'd again like you to uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, either directly or via our website or, or phone number there if you do have additional questions. Um, and again, uh, we're, we're more than happy to talk to you about how TrueShield can help you solve some of the problems that we discussed today. So with that, 